What I want to talk about today are clouds. Um, what we know about clouds is that they're one of the most beautifully diverse, yet ephemeral, that it's short-lived objects in the sky. And I've always been fascinated with clouds. I remember as a child, playing the day with my sister, lying on the beach or a field. What type of cloud do you see? Is it a dog? Is it a rabbit? Is it a dragon? I will play this game, right? And that's because clouds come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and they're short-lived, so they change quite quickly. One thing about clouds, they can be thick and dense, like cotton, or they can be dark and ominous, right, like thunderclouds. Either way, there are different words that we can use to describe clouds, right? They can be calming, they can be enticing, they can be enchanting. Altogether, I think they're just beautiful. But what we, or as people, um, don't realize about clouds is that they're really powerful as well. They play an important role in our lives. And so I'm going to talk about this importance. So when we talk about power, we talk about energy, right? And the sun in our solar system is our source of energy. We know the sun emits solar radiation that reaches Earth, right? And our atmosphere, essentially, lets some of these waves in and keeps some of them out. And so clouds are an important part of our atmosphere. They help regulate the energy balance of our climate system. And so the idea behind clouds is something like this. On a hot summer day when you're walking down the street, right, the sun is blazing, right, so you feel some of the waves hit the earth, right? It comes directly down on your face. I live in Riverside, so I know this in the hot summer, okay? <laughs> but let's say a cloud comes above me in the hot summer. That means that cloud, what it does is that it reflects some of that solar radiation back into space. So on Earth, you feel a lot cooler when the cloud is above you, right? So what we know about clouds is that they have what we call a cooling capacity. And so clouds account for 50% of the planetary albedo, which is a scientific term to describe the reflection of solar radiation back into space. And so what we know about clouds is that small changes in cloud cover actually have a huge effect on the global energy balance. In fact, it's been estimated that a 1% increase in global cloud cover can actually counteract from what we see by doubling greenhouse gas concentrations. So clouds are important, and they're necessary to be um, understood for climate, and we need to understand them to predict climate as well. So I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but this is a graph from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They have a report that comes out every seven years. And basically that report is the state of science of climate. And in this figure, you see the different anthropogenic or human-induced effects that affect climate. And what I really want to point out is the one with the largest uncertainty. They say clouds contribute the greatest uncertainty uh, for predicting climate. Okay, so just a brief overview of what I've just talked about the past five minutes. Clouds are beautiful. You've all known this since birth when we look at the sky but they're also powerful and important uh, for our life and human sustainability here on Earth. Lastly, clouds are difficult to predict. So, if you want to predict something, you need to understand how it forms, right? So how do clouds form? Well, the basic idea behind how clouds form is that you have water vapor, right? Gas or water in the gaseous form that can condense to form a droplet, right? So clouds are made of tiny little droplets. All right, now I would like you to close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes and imagine that you're having a hot, steamy shower. So those of you who saw the hot, steamy shower up on the screen, your eyes are not closed. Okay, so close your eyes. So you're having this really hot, steamy shower, okay? So hot and steamy that you can barely see the hand in front of your face. Now I want you to think about where do droplets form in this shower? Are they forming out of thin air? Hmm. Not quite. But if you look at the walls in the bathroom, if you look at your shower head or the mirrors in the bathroom, you see that's where the droplets are forming. Okay, so open your eyes. 
So in reality, in order for droplets to form, you need a surface, okay? It facilitates the condensation of water vapor. So in our atmosphere, we have these things called particles, atmospheric particles called aerosols, that provide the surface for water vapor to condense. So in this graphic, you see there's a particle, you have water vapor, and the water vapor then condenses on those particles to form the droplet. And so we have a special name for these types of particles. These particles are called cloud condensation nuclei. So the research that I do at UC Riverside looks at the types of particles in the atmosphere that influence cloud formation in terms of their CCN or cloud condensation nuclei properties. Okay, so just to reiterate this point, in this figure from NASA, they produced wonderful work. They show that water vapor, which is the figure on the right, is everywhere. You find water vapor all over the Earth, but in certain places you find clouds. And that's because you also need particles, and certain types of particles to form those clouds. All right. So another point I would like to emphasize is that the droplet size that forms matters. So for this, I have an analogy of you see the ice cubes and you see the crushed ice, right? Our ice cubes are kind of like these big droplets, and our crushed ice is kind of like our small droplets. And when you compare the two, you see the crushed ice is more reflective than the ice cubes, right? So in our atmosphere, the smaller droplets that make up clouds make up more reflective, brighter, wider clouds. And the large droplets are less bright, so you see them in storm clouds, they look great. So, again, droplet size affects the overall cloud reflectivity, which is going to affect the energy balance here on Earth. Okay, droplet size also has another effect. It also affects the cloud lifetime. That is, bigger droplets are more likely to run into other bigger droplets, coalesce, and form rain droplets, and rain out whereas smaller droplets have a larger cloud lifetime. So, in addition to affecting the reflectivity, you also have smaller droplets, which are brighter and have longer cloud lifetimes that affect the energy balance as well. All right, so why are clouds so difficult to predict? Well, I've talked about the different formation processes and I've talked about their effects. But if you consider the scaling of prediction, that is, if you consider clouds themselves, they're on the size of kilometers, right? And kilometers, they're about 10 to 10,000 football fields. But the formation process, and they're made of millions of droplets, right? And droplets are on the size of 10 to 50 microns, or micrometers. So how big is a micrometer? We're talking about the size of a red blood cell, or 1 one hundredth of a human hair. So we've gone from football fields to 1 one hundredth of a human hair. And in order to form those droplets, we need nano-scale particles. Those are our atmospheric aerosols, right? Those are the surfaces where the gas molecule, which is on the order of two to three angstroms, which is really tiny, condensed on the nanometer particles to form the micrometer droplets to then form the clouds, which are on the scale of 10 to 10,000 football fields. So going across all those different scales is very difficult to predict. Okay, so then I have this great idea. It came to me the other week or so, that clouds are a lot like people. That is, they are really difficult to predict, and people are also difficult to predict, right? But, in addition to that, if we consider ourselves as individual droplets, then also, collectively, we can also make a huge impact, like the droplets, millions of droplets making an impact on climate. So, as humans, we know that we can affect climate, we know we can affect clouds. The idea of cloud seeding has occurred for several decades. And the idea of cloud seeding is that you can add additional particles into your atmosphere um, from the exhaust of the plane to then form clouds that later rain out. We know this, we've done this in the past. In addition to that, we know that if we add more particles to a region where there are clouds, we can change essentially the droplet size to smaller sizes which thus affects the reflectivity and also the cloud lifetime. So as humans, we know that we have this capacity. And so there's been a development of a new field of science, or engineering, called geoengineering. And it's idea that perhaps what we can do as humans can improve human sustainability here on Earth. And so there's this great article 
um, which summarizes some of these geoengineering ideas. One of the ideas is perhaps we can pump salt particles from the ocean into the atmosphere, and by that modifying the clouds and the leaf activity. Another idea is just, you know what, if the energy is a source, if the sun is a source of energy, perhaps we should just block out the sun. That's the problem, right? That's the warming. I'm getting weird looks, but we'll get to that. But some of these ideas, are, most of these ideas are really costly. You need lots of ships, you need lots of energy to pump the salt back into the atmosphere. And blocking out the sun, who wants that? You know, we live in California, it's sunny, we like that, right? We don't want to get rid of the sun. So, I thought, hmm, if clouds are like people, maybe we can use that information to positively change an impact on them. And for that, we need collective action, like individual droplets. So I thought, hey, why don't we have a global day of reflection? And what is a global day of reflection? Not looking in the mirror, for all of us, but utilizing human energy and materials that we've already harvested. What about if we all wore some more reflective material? We all wore silver one day. Or we put mirrors on the top of our cars, right? Or put a little square piece of aluminum on all our roofs. What type of impact would that have? Could we possibly enhance our collective reflective powers? Well, I thought, okay, what if all of California participate? That would be great. You know, we have a lot of environmental activists here in California who would like to participate. What if we partic participate nationally? What kind of impact would this have? Or if my idea could go really far, what if we could do this globally? So I really got really excited about this idea. We could impact the climate for good if we all do this collectively, if we all engage in this idea. So I sat down and started doing calculations. And then I realized, ah, oh, there's a little snag in my thought. And that was, well, basically, we could enhance our collective reflectivity by 5%. But really, the uh, majority of Earth is covered in ocean. It's dark ocean that absorbs energy. 71% of the Earth is covered in ocean. So our reflectivity enhancement would not be that great unless we spend a lot of time holding up the science. So I need to go back and do the engineering calculations. But I still love this idea, maybe because I thought of it, right? I don't know if it's worth $3 million, maybe, please send my way. But what I like about this idea is that as individual droplets or people, we can make a difference. And, as and really, a collective solution is required to kind of reverse what we've done to our climate. And so if we really want to change what we're doing to our climate, we all need to participate. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening.